Welcome everyone. Back to Zooming. It's been a while since I've seen you all on Zoom. So very glad you could all be here and help us honor Black History Month. We have, um, this is, we're halfway through our programming. We have five programs uh, specifically celebrating this month and we spill over into March too with even another one. So very glad you could all be here. And for those of you who are guests, I have a special welcome to our now 129 year old Ebel of Los Angeles. And I'm going to turn this over to Madeline Murray. And uh, so Madeline and Wendy Gladney were chairs of this event and have done a wonderful job connecting us with Dr. Stephanie Myers. So I will let Madeline do the honors of introducing our guest. Okay, good afternoon, EBO members, friends and guests, and happy Black History Month. I'm Madeline Murray, and along with my fellow EBO member co-host, Wendy Gladney, we welcome you to today's book chamber featuring author, Dr. Stephanie Myers, who will give us an informative and eye-opening talk about her nonfiction historical book, The Invisible Queen, Mixed Ancestry Revealed, the biography of Sophia Charlotte. Queen of Britain and Ireland from 17. Yes, there really was a Black Queen of England. How come we never knew this? Charlotte, North Carolina is named after her. Prince William and Kate Middleton named their daughter after her as well. Now first, a little about Dr. Myers who joins us on this call from Washington, DC. Stephanie is a native of California and besides being an author, she has worked in the media and film as a producer and public relations executive she and her husband currently run a successful publishing and consulting business in DC. She has also worked in government as a presidential appointee for several federal agencies, including the Department of Commerce, Health and Human Services, the Office of Transportation, and the Office of Space Transportation. She is a Coro Foundation Fellow and holds a bachelor's degree from Cal State Dominguez Hills, a master's from Occidental College, and a PhD from Walden University. She's a bonus mom of three adult children, and she has five grandchildren and is a great, a great grandmother to three. I first met Stephanie, and she was Stephanie Lee in those days when we were back in high school here in LA. We didn't attend the same school, but we would often run into each other at parties and local community events. And I found her to be extremely personable, brilliant, and passionate about her education and her work. Coincidentally, I found out Wendy knew Stephanie also. And when Wendy and I were planning a book talk for the Ebel's Black History Month, we learned that we had both attended Dr. Meyer's book signing here in LA when the book first came out. We agreed we should have her speak to the Ebel. It's a fascinating and well-researched document, and that's why we wanted you to hear about it. If you haven't already purchased a copy, we hope that you will do so, and we will have more information about how you can obtain a copy. In the meantime, you feel free to ask questions, put them in the chat. Now, to start, first, Stephanie, tell us what inspired you to delve into this history and to write this book. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Madeline. Appreciate you and Wendy inviting me. And it's the Wilshire Bell or the E Bell has always been an institution in Los Angeles that I've been aware of forever. So thank you very much. It was really by accident that I met, as I say, met Queen Charlotte, Sophia Charlotte. My husband and I were just kind of messing around on the internet. He has some German heritage in his family. And as we were just looking up just names of people and situations that involved his heritage, we ran across a website that had a big picture of Queen Charlotte and it said, Queen Sophia Charlotte, a Black Queen of England. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, I don't think so. This is clearly some type of mistake. <laughs> so I began to research it. And the more I learned, the more fascinated I became with this story. And frankly speaking, a little angry also that I didn't know about it. You know, I thought, my goodness, I've been a reader all my life, going through all this school. How could I not know that there was a queen of England who had mixed race heritage and was queen for 57 years? So that's really kind of how it all started. Okay. Uh, Wendy, we have some slides, so we can go ahead and, and get started.
Okay. Um, we want, yeah, want to go back up to the top, right? And see if we can make it large. At any rate, as I said, I'm just yeah, proud can. to be part of the, thank you, the um, Evel of Los Angeles Book Chamber. Thank you very so much for the invitation. And it's nice to know that you're having five events honoring Black uh, History Month. That's outstanding because our history, Black history is American history. And the more you learn, the more you realize that. So that's great. Let's go to the next slide. And um, thanking Madeline and Wendy again for your leadership and for uh, making this all happen and being supportive. Uh, it's when you're an author and a publisher, you really do appreciate the people who support your initiative. So thank you to both of you. Next slide. Okay. Okay, it should go on to the next one, yes. Okay, The Invisible Queen. We gave the book that name because she really has been invisible in history. And there's so many interesting coincidences and, and circumstances in her life. For example, she was born on May 19, 1744. Megan and Harry got married on May 19th. <laughs> is that by accident? I don't think so, but that is what happened. There are many names in, in, the, in the history that we know of, of course, that have been names that we were raised with, but she was not one of them. But this woman was born in Mecklenburg, Strelitz, Germany. It's about 150 miles from Berlin. And she was born into a noble family. Uh, her dad was Duke Charles Louis Frederick and her mom was Elizabeth Albertina. And Elizabeth was descended from a family of Moors. Now we know the Moors were black people, mostly in Portugal. And it would seem as though the Moors in Portugal had a king, King Alphonse. And like many kings of that day, he had a wife, but he also had concubines. And so Elizabeth Albertina, Charlotte's mom, was the descendant of a series of family generations that grew out of a concubine named Madragana, who was having children for Queen Alphonse. So that's where her black heritage started. And she was there in Germany with her noble family, really living a pretty good life. Her dad was well-respected and, and she was, you know, coming from a top area. And really uniquely in the 1700s, Charlotte went to school. Now this was amazing for a young woman of any color, black, white, or whatever. But she went to a school there in Germany. She became educated. And as a part of her education, she began to learn about public policy and war and military. And, and there was a, a war going on in her community that Frederick the Great, who was the great leader, as you know, uh, in that part of Germany, in, in uh, Europe and Germany, Frederick the Great, he, had, he, was he was leading a war in the community where she was around in Mecklenburg. Now she knew Frederick the Great because her grandfather was a friend of his and Frederick the Great would actually come to their home. They had a palace there in, in Strelitz in Mecklenburg. So when she was 14 years old, Charlotte decided to write a letter to Frederick the Great to protest the war that he had started against the people in her region. Her letter became known in Europe and in our book, you'll see a copy of the letter. And this is what brought her to the attention of the royal family in England. So it's quite a story that King George III's mother, Dowager Augusta, wanted to find her son a wife. And so she had her military and her security guards and the guys who were close to her fan out around Europe and see which girls were available, who were single, who were from noble families, who could possibly marry her son. Well, Charlotte's name rose to the top mostly because of this letter she had written to Frederick the Great. So an invitation was extended through Charlotte's family asking her to marry King George III. Now he wasn't king yet, he was the prince at that point. And he was uh, in his early 20s. And I think of George as kind of a wild child because as history has it, George had a relationship on the side with a young Quaker girl named uh, Hannah Lightfoot. Now, my research shows that he had several children by Hannah, and his mother was upset. So she wanted to get rid of Hannah and have George marry a legitimate queen, and that's who Charlotte was. 
and Hannah was gotten rid of. She, uh, I think she was exported out of England. We're not sure where, but she may have been in America in one of the colonies. So that was kind of the beginning and how Charlotte was proposed to by the royal family to marry Prince George, and she agreed to do, do so. She came to England on a ship. There we go. Thank you, Wendy. She came to England in, in 1761 on a yacht. They sent, the British family sent a series of, of boats to pick her up, yachts to pick her up. And she came on the yacht over into England. Now, one of the stories I love is that Charlotte was a musician. Her dad taught her how to play the harpsichord and she loved to sing. And when they were on the boats coming across the water to England, there was a terrible, terrible storm. And there were several boats full of uh, some of the, the, the ladies in waiting who had been sent to meet her and bring her to England. Well, Charlotte decided to get her harpsichord out and she started to sing. And she sang through the storm and she calmed people down. So when they arrived in England and started, started traveling over to the palace for the uh, introduction of Charlotte to George, all of the ladies in waiting and everybody, they were all just chatting. Oh, she's great. She, she, she calmed us down in the middle of a storm. Oh, we really like her. So that's one of the early stories about how she met Prince George. And when she got to the palace and they met, he liked her right away. And they actually got married for the first time within 24 hours. And then they got married again at the coronation. Okay, Wendy, we can go on. Prince Harry and Meghan are not the first mixed race royal family. And that's what this story is really all about. And as I said, they got married on her birthday and they also got married in Queen Charlotte's favorite chapel. It's a chapel on the grounds where um, Windsor Palace is and they got married in that chapel. So this again was another, was that a coincidence? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Now, when you look at the mixed race heritage of the royal family, it's important to realize that Queen Elizabeth was a descendant of Queen Charlotte. Queen Elizabeth is the great granddaughter of Queen Victoria. She's the fifth generation great granddaughter of King George III and Queen Charlotte. And Queen Elizabeth's great grandmother was Queen Victoria. Now we heard a lot about Queen Victoria. She was incredibly popular. She was queen for 63 years. And Queen Victoria was the daughter of Queen Charlotte's son, Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent. Mm -hmm. So Charlotte is the ancestor of the current royal family. And all of this upheaval in England about Harry marrying a, a mixed race girl, a girl of black heritage, who, by the way, as you all know, comes from our Crenshaw community. <laughs> all of that fuss is just so phony because Queen Elizabeth was there. And when Queen Elizabeth was sworn in as queen in the 50s, she allegedly made some comments about having a family of mixed heritage, but it's hard to find that. It's kind of rumored and I couldn't document that too well. Okay, let's go on. Next slide, Wendy. Mm -hmm. So Queen Charlotte marries King George. They have this fabulous coronation. People come from all over the world, and she is his wife. The Dowager Augusta's happy. She now has a qualified, educated woman to be the wife of her wild child son, as I call him, King George. And they one of the things that George did within the first two or three years of their marriage was purchase Buckingham Palace for her. Now, for those of you who've been to London and you've visited Buckingham Palace, did you know that a mixed race woman was the first owner and occupant of that palace? Well, that's the case. And they had a number of palaces that they lived in and they loved, they, Neither George nor Charlotte really liked the pomp and circumstance too much of being the royal family. So they had country residences. Windsor Castle was in Berkshire, Frogmore at Windsor. The queen had a, a cottage that she really loved. And Harry and Meghan lived in Frogmore 
That's mm -hmm. the place the royal family gave them to stay. So those are three connections, the birth date, marriage, the chapel they got married in, and living at Frogmore. So I just find that to be quite fascinating. While they were there at Buckingham Palace, they started their family. And Charlotte and George had 15 children, 15 children. Two of them died early, unfortunately, but the other 13 made it to adulthood. And they, you know, they were a part of the royal family and, and well known. Also, while they were there at Buckingham and the other palaces, King George and the Queen, they really developed a number of hobbies together. And Charlotte was given the name Queen of Botany. And I imagine that those of you who've been to England have visited the Kew Gardens. Well, she didn't start the Kew Gardens. Actually, her mother-in-law, Dowager Augusta, started the Kew Gardens, but Queen Charlotte really expanded and developed them. And she made that a real hobby of hers. And she brought animals in from all over the world that some of the explorers that the king was supporting would go to different countries, including Africa, and bring animals back. And she had them at the Kew Gardens. So that was one of their hobbies. A second hobby was that they loved astronomy. And they would gaze through telescopes at the stars. And there was a young woman astronomer in England. Her name was Carolyn Herschel. And she wanted to name a comet after the queen, and she did. So there's a comet named for Queen Charlotte. And Charlotte helped Carolyn become the first legal woman employee of the British government. Charlotte Herschel got a job in the government because Queen Charlotte promoted her and supported her. So they had the 15 children, they taught them, uh, two of their infants that died, uh, did die from smallpox, but King George and Queen Charlotte supported the scientists who were doing research into different uh, medicines and vaccines for smallpox, and they actually contributed to helping the smallpox vaccine be discovered. And I'm sure that was because their own children had died from it, but that was a big contribution that they made to the world. Okay, next slide. Now, one of the factors about Charlotte that I, when as I did my research, and I really, really fell in love with her, was that when she became the queen, she really kept herself in touch with the people. And at this time, we had the transatlantic slave trade going on. We're talking about the 1760s, 1780s, 1790s, the same time that the American Revolution was going on. King George was the king, and that's who the revolution was against, King George III. Well, when Charlotte learned about slavery, she became an abolitionist, and she became close to William Wilberforce, that Wilberforce University is named after. She became close to a man named Granville Sharp, and she was a known abolitionist. Now, can you imagine this woman's the Queen of England, a mixed race woman married to King George and has the courage to come out against slavery, which was the huge profit maker for so many of the businessmen in England. Well, she did it, she did it. Next slide, please. And one of the uh, proofs that she was an abolitionist was that Queen Charlotte joined the anti-saccharine movement to protest slavery and the sugar industry. And they, there was a guy there in England who was a cartoonist. And he thought that he would do a cartoon of her not allowing her children to have sugar. The anti-saccharine movement protested slavery because many of the enslaved people in the West Indies and in America were growing sugar cane. And they were working as enslaved people with the sugarcane industry, like cotton, tobacco, these were all some of the products, and sugarcane was one of them. So Charlotte said, I'm not eating any sh sugar, and neither are you. So this showed where in 1792, and I'm reading this from the book, the royal family's public opposition to slavery was satire satirized in a cartoon by James Gilray. He portrayed Queen Charlotte and their daughters with King George III, saying, oh, delicious, delicious, as he, seeped, as he sipped his tea without sugar. 
And if you look at the picture, there is no question about the graphics of her face that the artist, James Gilray, saw her as a woman with features that would be described as African-American, Negroid, African heritage, whichever term you choose to give it, look at the face and there it is. So this is a cartoon that they had and they were making fun of her. He was ridiculing people like the cartoonists do today. We have all these comedians everywhere who love to make uh, cartoons of the politicians. So he was no different. Okay, next slide, please. But this was a really big deal, the, the anti-saccharine movement and the abolitionist movement. This looks, yes, okay. And going back to that before I shift to the next subject, but this, this slide is fine, Wendy. You had the American Revolution, as I mentioned, going on in America with the colonies, of course. Well, many people don't realize that there were thousands of enslaved people who ran away from the plantations and joined the British army. Now, the head of the England government in Virginia was a man named Lord Dunmore. And Lord Dunmore was married to, excuse me, Lord Dunmore's son was married. Let me get this right. Lord Dunmore's daughter was married to one of Queen Charlotte's sons. Well, Lord Dunmore was the governor, the royal governor of Virginia. And as the story goes, he took pictures of Charlotte and had them shown to enslaved people in Virginia. And he was in Williamsburg. I have visited his house in Williamsburg. As the story goes, Lord Dunmore showed the picture of Queen Charlotte to enslaved people and said, look, the British are on your side. You need to fight with us, the British, against the colonists because the colonists, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, these guys were slave owners. And it was well known. George Washington had his plantation on Mount Vernon and he had hundreds of slaves. So many of the black people did go fight on the side of the British. And I know that Lord Dunmore would not have shown those pictures of Queen Charlotte to those enslaved people without her permission. That was part of her abolitionist belief. So just a few other points about her and we can open up and have a, a, a conversation. She was, she was really, as I indicated, educated. She was compassionate. One of my other favorite stories, and as you were coming in earlier, you were listening to Mozart music that was uh, posted up by one of the organizers of our event today. But at, when she was there at Buckingham Palace, a family from um, Vienna came in with their eight-year-old boy and had him audition for the queen. She loved her music. So she was always letting children come and audition for her, play with her. She sang with them. Well, this eight-year-old boy went on to be a mentee of hers. She supported him. She helped him. And of course, his parents were right there with him. We're talking about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Mm. Now, how many of us knew that a woman, the Black Queen of England, I'm going to say she was Black because one drop of Black blood could put you in slavery, so let's say a woman with mixed race, black heritage, discovered Mozart. Wow, <laughs> that really, I just love that. And her children were very involved with music and with the classical musicians. Another thing that she did was Charlotte realized that there were girls there in England who were orphans. They'd lost their families for various reasons. They were living alone. And there was no such thing as the welfare system where you could uh, you know, automatically have some type of foster care home that got money from the government. So a lot of these girls were orphans and had no futures. Charlotte brought some of these girls into the different palaces and taught them how to, um, um, how to embroider, how to design and make coverings and curtains and how to help decorate uh, homes. And you can just imagine that these young ladies, once they were grown, they were in great demand because here they were um, doing sewing and making all these beautiful things for the palaces and that gave them a skill. And she worked with these young girl orphans over the years and helped them. One of her other contributions was Charlotte realized that while she had had 15 children and had all the health care and all the support that you could ever want, poor pregnant women did not. 
So she helped to establish a hospital there in England for poor women to be able to go in and get medical care. And of course, today in America, we still have poor people, what, on the streets, homeless, people can't get access to care. She saw that issue then and she did something about it. Okay, Wendy. So Queen Charlotte was a multifaceted woman. She brought a lot of things to the table. She was um, a writer. She was very, very involved, as I said, in the abolitionist movement. She was a botanist. She loved her music. She developed relationships with uh, Africans. There were people that came into England that she that wrote her letters asking her to advocate on behalf of freedom, and she did that. And I just believe that she should be put right on the same list with every other great person in the world because she had that ability. And one of the things that Charlotte did was that her husband was mentally ill. King George developed, I think it was bipolar schizophrenia. We don't know exactly what the disease was, but he would get so sick sometimes that they had to lock him in his room or tie him down in his bed. And those of you who may have seen the movie, The Madness of King George, that's what that was all about. That was a true story. So Queen Charlotte managed to hold on to the throne for 57 years in spite of the fact that her husband had mental illness. And she did this even though their eldest son tried to fight his father for the throne. Their oldest son said, hey, my daddy's sick. He's no good. He shouldn't be the leader. Give it to me. Charlotte fought her oldest son and won. The parliament sided with her and allowed her to continue to be queen even though they knew the king was suffering from mental illness. So she was an amazing woman. And um, I'll stop there and we can kind of, Wendy, we can go on to the last slide here. I think this is the last one coming up. And I certainly invite all of you to, um, um, our book is available at myerspublishing.com. We, um, we distribute the book exclusively. This is where my husband comes in. He said, I'm not giving 70% to Amazon. <laughs> So we distribute the book exclusively and you can get it through myerspublishing.com and we get it out to you within about four or five days. We can turn it around. So, so thank you very much for the opportunity to be with the eBell book party. This is wonderful. And uh, I'm open for any questions, comments that anyone has. Okay. So let's go to view options and do full screen. Okay, so we open it up for questions in chat. So I will start. Um, you can unmute yourself if you wish and ask a question or you can put it in the chat. I, I have a comment. Yeah, go okay. ahead. I, I find it interesting. I mean, I actually have the book and I've uh, read the book and and it's funny because every time I hear Dr. Myers tell the story, which this is, I've heard it a couple of times now, it's still fascinating to me. And one of the things that I find interesting is I too am of, of mixed heritage. My uh, mother's family's from Germany and my father's family's from uh, Texas and also Virginia. So I know just, you know, even what it means to even be a person of uh, mixed race and how, like you said, in America, if we just have one drop, you know, what, how we are considered um, African-American or black or whatever the term is. And, and I'm proud of it. I'm very proud of it. On my father's side, my grandmother was first born generation free in our family. Her father was born a slave in 1861. So I, I, t I, I'm, I'm the keeper of our family history and I have all this stuff documented as well. But I find it interesting that because in Europe, uh, the countries, especially when you're talking about the time of Queen Charlotte, there was so much intermarriage. There was so much interconnection, it, even today, because the royals want to stay among the royals but yet how this story it has taken forever for it to really come to light so i too just want to say thank you dr myers for sharing um this story and and the truth of the story and how even with the whole marriage of uh uh i forget how they call them, but harry and megan but they call themselves h and m um you know has brought so much of this to light so just thank you for being with us today 
Yeah, it's important for our children also to know the story because we've been given this impression that all of our people were somehow enslaved and we didn't have any real heritage that we could be proud of. And that's just not true. So we just have to um, make sure that everyone knows. And it's important for white children to understand it as well. Because in America, when you do the heritage of most people here, they have Native American blood, Black blood. There's all kinds of mixed race, Wendy, as you well know. But people don't know it or they ignore it. So we've got to move toward our country towards realizing we are truly one and we have to stop all this division madness that we have going on. Okay. And I'm not sure who's managing the questions in the mm -hmm. in the question box, but we do have a couple of questions that I'm seeing in the chat box. And um, I'm gonna try to go so I can put the information for people on how they can purchase your book. But the two questions are, uh, where did Queen Charlotte immigrate to England from? And they want to know what are your the best sources for your research in terms of how you put together your your book. Okay, well, she was from Mecklenburg, Germany, um, a city, Strelitz, Mecklenburg, Germany, and it was. And I haven't been there yet. I hope to go with a camera crew and you know do a whole production there. But it was uh, about a hundred miles from Berlin. I've been to Berlin but it was 150 miles away from Berlin. And so she was in this part of Germany. And there was obviously mixed race families there because her mom was there married to the Duke and they were considered as a regular normal family. And so normal that of course the, the queen of England would come in and, and recruit her to come and marry her son. So she was from Mecklenburg. And I find it fascinating <clears throat> when you go down to um, North Carolina to the city of Charlotte uh, Mecklenburg County is, this, oh. is the county that Charlotte is in. The city of Charlotte is in Mecklenburg. Yeah. And there are other parts of the country called Mecklenburg. So that's uh, just a kind of a connection there. And, and then in terms of the research, um, because I live in Washington, D.C., the Library of Congress is here. So I was able to go there and do research. Um, the internet, as you all know, is incredible. So a lot of the research was done through sources that I could find on the web, and then I could contact them directly and do a lot of the research that way. And then there, there are other books that have been written about King George and Queen Charlotte. And so I was able to draw from them and uh, able to, to learn what they learned. So there was no one source. And when you see the book, you'll see a lot of footnotes in there and, and, and all of that. And of course, Charlotte was brought into the movie uh, Bridgerton. I'm sure many of you have been fans of Bridgerton because it was so popular. And it was just fascinating that um, when Bridgerton was originally written, the book of Bridgerton did not have the character Queen Charlotte in it. Queen Charlotte was introduced into the storyline later. So it's always been intriguing to me because my book came out in 2017 and Madeline was at a book party that we did. I think it was around 2018 and Wendy's had her copy a number of years. And then, oh, ho! Oh, all of a sudden, 20 in 2020, um, up pops Bridgerton. <laughs> so I wonder if perhaps there might have been some connection there somewhere that I'm not aware of. But I was glad to see that she was introduced into the national media. And of course, there will be a movie in May about Charlotte as a young girl. And, and the stories that I'm sharing with you now about her as a young girl and her schooling and coming to England and marrying George, I'm sure all of that will be uh, recorded in there. Dr. Mm -hmm. Myers, another question is, does the current British royal family, Charles and sons, et cetera, acknowledge the mixed race of their ancestor, Queen Charlotte, or did that die with Queen Elizabeth? I think it died with Queen Elizabeth. I have not seen or heard any reference to, uh, to their acknowledgement of who she was. Although her portrait, the book, the cover, you know, the pictures on the cover of our book, they're in museums in England. So it's not a secret. And you can tell by looking at her that she has the heritage. So she's, she's just kind of invisible in plain sight. Her portraits are there, her history's there, the Kew Gardens are there, all of it is there, but you just kind of don't, don't mention it and it goes away. All of the scandal, that horrible man who wrote those terrible things about Megan saying that, you know, she should be marched down the street naked and have, you know, excrement thrown at her. This journalist who said horrible things about Megan. What a fool. What an idiot. 
And I really was wishing that, you know, King Charles or, or Camilla or somebody would put him in his place and say, look, you don't know, buddy, but we've got the DNA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that hasn't happened yet. There's another uh, question. I'm well, not I have some comments. OK, I'm number here. one, do you think that maybe the historians have altered her appearance or whitened her skin? Because I have found in history books that they tend to do that to anglicize a lot of people who may have been mixed race? Absolutely, Madeline. The whitening of the skin of people of color has been something that has happened many, many times, yes. You know, sometimes I wonder if uh, Barack Obama will end up 100 years from now <laughs> with whitened skin. You know, you just never know. But yes, that has happened traditionally down through the years because it's awkward. It's awkward to have people who are enslaved and then at the same time, have a queen of England on the throne. How do you make that make sense? How do you make that make sense to your own family, to your own children? You know, they, they're not stupid. They're smart. So yes, I think that there was a lot of whitening that went on and, uh, and still goes on. Mm -hmm. But that's where the exciting part is. It's our job to make sure that the story comes forward and that people know the truth. And then there's two things in the book I want to point out as a point of history, two points that I did not know. Number one, that when black slaves were enticed to join the army for Britain in the Revolutionary War, that they were promised their freedom. And those that served were given um, a place to stay in Nova Scotia. And that to this day, Nova Scotia has a sizable black population because thousands of these troops were sent there. I did not know that until I read that in the book. And then yes, the other thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I thought was interesting, okay, you mentioned Lord Dunmore, whose daughter married Charlotte's son. Well, Lord Dunmore's real name was John Murray. And my husband's name is John Murray. <laughs> <laughs> and he was born, he was born in Lynchburg, Virginia. And his oh. grandma's name was Charlotte. Oh, really? Yes. But oh, I mean, my. all of that is just pure coincidence. <laughs> oh, dear. We're <laughs> going to have to start calling you Princess, uh, Princess <laughs> Madeline. No, I but it. I mean, the book resonated with me, and I, I, I just wanted to make those comments. But thank you well, so much. Well, it's very important because the story of the Black people who worked on the side of the British, what is amazing is when the war was over, there was enough integrity on the part of George Washington and the colonists who lost to have negotiations with the British leadership. The British demanded that those people be let free. And they demanded that the colonists who had won the war meet with them in New York. And there was a tavern in New York where the negotiations took place. And those people had to prove that they had fought with the British. And when they were able to prove it, the British had ships right there at the dock in lower Manhattan and took them up to Nova Scotia and to Canada. And the county in Nova Scotia is called Queen Charlotte Sound. That's the larger area where Nova Scotia is located. And one of the men that she worked with as an abolitionist, Granville Sharp, he was very involved in helping the people from Nova Scotia. Some of them were discriminated against up there and had a really rough time. They moved and went to Sierra Leone. And this abolitionist, Granville Sharp, not all of the Black people from, C from Nova Scotia went there, but quite a few did. And they established the country of Sierra Leone. And I'm sure Charlotte had a hand in that as well, as well, because Granville Sharp was one of her best friends and used to play in, uh, they had a music ensemble that they would play in every Sunday. So I know she knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, we have a question in the chat box. I'm sorry, it's from Arlene Bernholtz, and I'm not sure if I'm going to say it correctly, but she says, wasn't the kind diagnosed with some- Oh, the king. I think she is. Okay. That's what I was saying. I didn't know what exactly. Okay. So wasn't the king diagnosed with some type of urinary infection that was contributing to his obscure behavior? Well, there have been a lot of explanations. Um, king Charles believes that it was some type of an infection or perhaps a food disease that he had that was causing the mental illness who knows, from what I've read and what I've heard about the, uh, the strength of his mental illness, it seemed like it was a little more than a urinary infection, 
I mean, we've we've seen people who have urinary infections and they don't necessarily go completely out of control. They had to tie him down in his bed on occasion because he would just lose it. And then he would be all right, you know, a couple of weeks after that. So he went back and forth. So the actual diagnosis of his mental disease, since it was happening in the 1700s, we'll never really know. But yes, there are a lot of speculations about what he had. Could there have been too much inbreeding? <clears throat> before Absolutely. They, before they brought her from another country to marry? I mean, if cousins were marrying cousins and all of that. Well, the inbreeding took place on, on all sides. There was lots of inbreeding that happened within the British, Irish, and Scottish cultures of that time. And certainly with the uh, enslaved people, there was inbreeding. So yes, I'm sure there wasn't the same monogamy and the same kind of um, system. People married cousins sometimes because that's how they kept the wealth in the family. So yes, there was a lot of intermarriage. Okay. There's no more questions in the chat box right now. So if anybody has a question, you can uh, raise your hand and hopefully we'll see it. Do we know anything about her childhood? Well, yes. Um, what we know about her childhood was that she did attend school and she went to, it was kind of a religious school and she was going, she was tutored in German, French and Italian by a Lutheran scholar, and she learned how to speak and translate those languages. So you can see what an incredible value she was as the queen. And she, she loved education, she loved to read, and um, was in this particular school. She actually became, um, they gave her a title, let me see if I can find it in here, but she, she, be, she was very religious. And since she was attending this private school, the Hereford Ministry of Westphalia, it was called, and she would attend that and she didn't plan to become a nun. But on March 7th, which happens to be my birthday, March 7th, and that when I was doing the research and I ran across that date, I said, oh, dear, I guess I'm supposed to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. But on March 7th, 1760, Charlotte was invested as a canoness of the ministry. Now, this is the Hereford Ministry in Germany, where she was going to school. So a canonist, she was supposed to live under a religious rule. And so she was very religious. I mean, she had her faith and she kept that with her as queen. And there's no rumor of either King George III or Queen Charlotte being unfaithful to each other. And, you know, there were always lots of rumors about the kings and having all kinds of women on the side and the queens having lovers and all that. But that was not, that didn't come up. So she seemed to be very, um, very honest and very, very full of integrity in the way that she operated. And so I think she had the kind of value system that we really, we really want people to, to imitate. Mm -hmm. And then her music, she just loved her music and had ensembles that she played regularly and musicians and her kids and she sang. And Mozart, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the first songs that he composed, he dedicated to her when he was a little boy. Mm -hmm. So I see Julie has a question, but I saw Angela's hand up. Okay, you're on mute. Unmute. You're unmute. Unmute. Thank you. I was um, looking at the common person's history books, you know, Wikipedia, and nothing of what you're saying about her uh, racial heritage is in Wikipedia. It's just nowhere. Wow. Well, I read it too, and it, it's almost like they deny it. They acknowledge, they say, well, some people say, but we don't really believe this, and there's really no truth or no proof. So you still have <laughs> people powwowing to say this is not believable. Well, that's a segue right into Julie's question, because Julie's asking, what is known about the ancestry of Queen Charlotte, and who might have been her original African ancestors? Okay, well, that was Madragana. And there is a, a researcher, Mario de Comcun is his name, Mario de Valdez el Comcun. And he decided he was going to research Charlotte's heritage, which he did. And he, um, he actually did the genealogical research of her background and traced her back to King Alphonse and to uh, her Madragana being the um, 
the maternal ancestor. So he has, and I spoke with him on the phone and he was, you know, it's in the book. I'm looking, looking for the page. I, I lose it myself sometimes, but it's in the book that she was traced back to Madragana and that King Alphonse, who was the king of Portugal, uh, was her ancestor in that regard. So yes, Mario del Camp, 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 Mario del Vadez e Cancun, and they did a um, movie on it. PBS. If you Google it, you will find a film online that uh, talked about her her heritage and her black heritage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, other hands up. I I'm going back and forth between both pages well, of just you know I just wanted to say that growing up in high school they made us read Wuthering Heights and the big deal behind <laughs> that romance was that he was a moor and I think you're frozen Madeline well while she's coming back on I'll just um Read a little section here. Mario de Valdez e Cocum, a Jesuit educated man from Belize and historian of the African diaspora and researcher for the public broadcasting system, became fascinated with Charlotte's heritage and researched it extensively. So he's the person who really, and also J.A. Rogers, who was a famous historian in 1952. He did a book called Nature Knows No Color Line. And <clears throat> J.A. Rogers also referred to Charlotte and talked about her being an ancestress of King the Sixth of England and that she was um, a woman with an evident Negro strain is what J.A. Rogers said. And he's a renowned historian and uh, he also documented her, her history. So it's interesting, um, Madeline, that they that you're right. Wikipedia talks about Charlotte, but they they leave the racial part out of, out of it. Well, one of our members, D, I think it's Dion, and then also Phil has commented that you can update Wikipedia with facts as long as you can properly source it to be to update it. And you know what? I mean, it, it is true. I mean, um, I mean, just even from a personal perspective, uh, like I mentioned, I'm I'm half white and half black. My mother's family's from Germany. My grandfather and great grandfather were Lutheran ministers, and they never acknowledged the fact that their first grandchild was black, which is me. And I was <laughs> born. I'm in my 60s, you know. So I can tell you firsthand it happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Patty says. Do you have a theory about why acknowledging Queen Charlotte is so difficult for the current royal family? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Well, I think that it just has to do with the implicit bias and the old fashioned stratification of class, class and race mm -hmm. is still real. And the British family may feel that if they were to admit having some black heritage, that there may be other royal families in Europe that will start to, to um, attack them. You know, a lot of the people in, in England, there, are, there is a faction of people in England that would prefer that they not have this royal family that cost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to support. All, I mean, it's incredible that they've been able to maintain that power. And so I suspect that they may worry that if they gave any opportunity for someone to pull them down, perhaps they would use that. And it could be that the racial issue, personally, I think it would strengthen them. I think that if the Royal family would admit to their mixed race heritage, embrace Meghan and Harry. When you look at the British empire all over the world, much of which is in countries of color, I think that they would strengthen their power if they were to openly acknowledge their relationship to the rest of the world and just fess up and say, you know, we messed up and, and we want to fix it and we want the world now to, to operate us as, as, as one. I think that would be incredible. And maybe if, if Harry and Meghan, you know, get an opportunity to rule or, or get back, to, back into the position that they're entitled to, they'll be able to do some of that. Well, I don't know about the ruling part since they're so far down, but, yeah. you know, like you say, to have at least a voice. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So Madeline, it's about 10 minutes to five. I don't know if there's anyone else. Hillary, are you raising your hand? Well, I was just going to say part of with the deal with the royal family is they're really Germanic branch of the family and they've never really wanted. The royal family is very worried about their ability to maintain their power. And so they don't want to do anything that dilutes their claim to being British and being English. So they really very quickly, that's why they took the name Windsor. That's not their real name um, because they don't want to be associated with being anything but English because they don't want to dilute their sense of power. Um, so it may just not be just a race thing. It may also be the German side of it too. Well, that's a very good point because King George III was the first member of the royal family to actually be born in England. All of the other ones were, were Hanovers and they were born in Germany. So that's a really good point. And I think you're absolutely right. They are very worried about that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie says, I believe in one of the current royal families of Luxembourg Berg, uh, or somewhere, the wife is African-American. Does anyone know if that has caused any controversy? I'm not even aware. Yeah. No, I'm not aware of that. Okay, hmm. Julie, you're going to make us do some more research. <laughs> uh, Cheryl says, if interested in learning more about uh, Blacks during the Revolutionary War and Blacks during being offered land and freedom in Nova Scotia, if they help the British, there is a fabulous historical fiction book called Somebody Knows My Name. Huh. Oh, no. Sounds like something we should look at, book club. Yeah, somebody. Yeah, no. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, I apologize. I got kicked off AT and T internet and had to come back on through Spectrum. So when I was speaking before, I don't know if I froze. We did do a tech check, and I was kind of worried that my AT and T would do that, and it did. I'm sorry. I apologize. But anyway, I'm back on. <laughs> okay. Well, share with us what you were saying, Madeline. Well, what I was saying was that in high school they made us read Wuthering Heights. And the big deal about that romance, it was sort of a Romeo and Juliet type romance, was that she was fell in love with a Moor. And, and they didn't really explain to us in high school the significance of why <laughs> that was the bad thing. I just thought, okay, he's from Morocco, big deal, you know, so he was a Moor. But the, this puts that into context and it gives us a lot more information. So thank you. Absolutely. Yes. And and what's going on in Florida right now? We all have to take this so seriously, those of you. And that's why I'm so thrilled to see the Ebel uh, Women Women's Club addressing Black history, because the women members of Abel have always been leaders in Los Angeles, and I'm sure the state and the country. And what's happening now, and you know what Governor DeSantis is doing down in Florida, he has literally taken just dozens of authors out of the library system. And these are books that are well-written, well-researched by people who have excellent credentials. And they're just deciding that this is the critical race theory and they don't want it in the uh, libraries or the public schools. This is very dangerous. That's like book burning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's we can't let this happen. And I think it's really important that people realize we have got to fight for that freedom of speech and freedom to read and freedom to learn. Because if we end up in an autocracy where we're dictated to and we can't read this and we can't do that, that, that could be terrible. I think Someone Rosalind declare, has her hand up. Rosalind? Hi. I just wanted to say, first of all, I am a retired librarian from both the public sector and the academic sector. And I agree with what uh, Dr. Meyer has said. And I wanted to make one additional point. It is not only based in Florida, there is a movement across this country of parents who feel that anything that deviates from um, what they have been raised to think about societal things and so forth is totally counter to what should be in a public school. And it's just, it's so distressing 
absolutely distressing to have this occur. We're incredibly fortunate to be in a state where um, it doesn't happen quite as frequently or as vociferously as in other parts of the country. But I just wanted to make that point that it is not only based in Florida, but there are groups that are very well organized across the country. Very true. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say one additional thing. <laughs> this whole movement proves, in my opinion, that ignorance is rampant because the whole notion of equating what's going on with critical race theory is just bogus because it is wrong. Critical race theory is a graduate study theory and it has nothing to do with the material that these authors that Dr. Meyer has uh, mentioned. These are stories, stories of people, stories of events and they are written by people who are responsible, responsible writers. And it's, it's just horrifying. That's all I have to say. Thank and you. Absolutely. Thank you. And Patty put something very good in our chat box that everybody should try to look at. Uh, and she says it's uh, Mississippi's capital, old racial divides take new form a plan by Republican lawmakers to set up a new court system served by a state-run police force for parts of mainly Black Jackson has become a flashpoint for racial and political divisions. So she, Patty shared that in our chat box. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, I looked up while we were all chatting about when the question came up about Luxembourg. So Princess Angela of Lechenstein, she's actually, um, they said that she's, born in Panama, but was raised in the United States. So she's a woman of color, but she's from Panama. She considers, considers herself a Panamanian American. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. To go back to the point that, that our librarian just made, um, Ms. Goddard, you're a book club, and I really encourage everyone to read the book that J.D. Vance wrote, Hillbilly Elegy. Oh, yeah. Because I believe part of what's fueling this are the descendants of white indentured servants. Right. It's another overlooked part of history. Right. We don't fully appreciate how many white indentured servants there were. We know they were not enslaved and they were given land and land grants, but a lot of them were treated very badly by the aristocrats. We talk about the trailer parks and the people that had to live that were poor whites. Well, J.D. Vance and I, I hate to suggest anybody pay any money to make him richer, get it from the library, but he really describes the group of people who are gaining more power mm -hmm. and they're angry. They uh, are often very ignorant. Um, there's some movies on Netflix, Breaking Bad, that I saw last year that really reflect the anger of the people, the white people who have been treated pretty badly and then they've been kind of told black people are the it's are the fault and the reason why the reason why you don't have money the reason why you don't have this or that right. is because of them well right. that's not true but anyway i just mentioned that's another book that i found to be incredibly insight you know i learned a lot from reading that the last thing that i will say if i may wikipedia you have to be very careful <laughs> and there are sources, sources, ladies, and if there are gentlemen in the audience, forgive me, that are far more reliable. And I'm speaking as a librarian now who has shared these kinds of things with students and also spoken up when uh, some of my friends have, have uh, said, well, Wikipedia, and I, I have to say, look, don't talk to me yet me about wikipedia because yeah. <laughs> yeah, i i wouldn't use them as a source no. No. <laughs> no okay well thank you all and phyllis uh, yes i'd just like to wrap up with um thanking everybody for attending and this has been a very dynamic discussion which i think we all appreciate and good lending itself to 
what we want to do as part of our mission. I also want to invite you to our upcoming programs and um, our we have a luncheon on Friday for Black History, but unfortunately it's sold out, but I believe uh, right, we're still good. taking a waiting list, but um, <laughs> that is going to be fun. But then we still have many seats available for our um, big luncheon, our big Monday speaker luncheon on next Monday, which will be with um, one of our esteemed members, Phoebe Beasley, who is a very well respected and well-known artist. And she's going to be talking with Wendy in conversation about African-American art and collecting African-American art. And she will be exhibiting some of her paintings. And this is going to be proving to be a very, um, on a very exciting program. So we hope you can all join us for lunch. And if you can't come to lunch, you know, you can still come to the program. Um, so we can look forward to seeing you. And our history room is going to be open that day for several hours, I believe, before the program and perhaps after with a, um, a newly reclaimed room we have in our building where we're exhibiting. It's like a pop-up exhibits uh, telling Ebel history. And this current exhibit is focusing on our um, World War II efforts of our women in the 1940s and what we did to help support the war. So I invite you all up to the history room on the second floor to take a look. One more thing. I just want to encourage everyone to please look in the chat box because I put the information in there if you're interested in Dr. Meyer's book. So again, you can look on in the chat box and uh, learn how you can purchase her book. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This was really an honor and a privilege to be with Ebel. Thank you. Dr. Myers, thank you very much from all of us. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Happy Mardi Gras. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong. So long, Wendy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Madeline. Okay. Great. Bye now.